All right, so I'm Caleb Seifer. I'm one of the professors in psychology here. My talk is Emerging Ambivalence Among Emerging Adults, How Interpersonal Ambivalence Impacts College Students. I'm going to talk to you today about some research that I do with some undergrad college students here and some of the findings that we have obtained. But first, let me give you a quick background on attachment theory. So attachment theory presupposes that the relationships you form during development and the relationships that you make as you go through your life influence the way that you cope with stress. This ultimately affects your health and it affects your well-being. We've studied attachment in college students and we know that your attachment style links to important outcomes like your GPA, your overall happiness level. So you might wonder, why study anything additionally about attachment if we already have good research? In order for me to answer that question for you, I have to give you a little bit more background. Historically, attachment has used the three little bears model of attachment. They say some people are too cold. They're not interested in relationships, and this causes them problems. We call them dismissive. They're usually over-focused on self-achievement and under-focused on connecting with others. At the other end of the spectrum, some people are too hot. Many of you have met these people in your life. They're so concerned with relationships that they can't focus on self-development, on achievement. They're very, very, very anxious that their partners will leave them. And we know in studies of college students that roughly 70 to 75% are actually just right. They're in the middle. They're able to balance autonomy needs, so trying to achieve and build skills, with fostering relationships. And these students generally have better outcomes in college. In the 90s, we learned that actually this way of thinking about attachment is not correct. That when we measure attachment, we don't get three buckets. Instead, what we get is two dimensions. One is avoidance. These are people who like to keep people at arm's length, prefer to rely on themselves. Another is anxiety. These are people concerned with relationships. But that fourth quadrant is fearful avoidance. We didn't know what that was. Fearful avoidance involves interpersonal ambivalence. This is when someone simultaneously has a strong desire to form relationships and is afraid that if they let others close, that will prove harmful. They'll end up hurt. When they do get into relationships, they chronically think, should I stay or should I go? And most of them end up leaving, which leaves them feeling lonely and on their own. Currently, there is no way to measure interpersonal ambivalence directly. What we've done here is we've developed a measure it has items on it, like, I'd like to form connections with others, but I find myself withdrawing before connection is made. Everyone is some level of interpersonal ambivalence, and this measure is designed to complement existing measures, not replace them. In other words, what our hypothesis is, is that we can directly measure this vector. We think it's unique, but clearly associated with both dimensions, so it's kind of interesting. Unique, but related. Further, we believe it's related to a roughly equal degree. So we've now given the measure to over 2,000 people. When you do a factor analysis, first you start with your eyes. This is called the elbow. And we look at how many dots there are above that elbow. As you can see here, there's not two, there is indeed three. We don't just use our eyes, we do use numbers of factor analysis. Don't worry, I know you can't see these. What's important is if an item loads at less than 20, we don't add anything. These are all the avoidance items. You can see they're all clustered together. All the anxiety items, they're clustered together. And then here's our scale, clusters together. So it's clearly separate from these other factors. However, is it separate in the way we expect it? It turns out in our large sample, it's correlated about 0.45 with anxiety, 0.45 with ambivalence. If you plot that, that's about here. And if you run an arrow through it, that's here. To be honest, Better than I ever imagined. <laughs> this is a best case scenario for me. Great, so we show that we can measure it. Measuring it is the first step in proving something, but ultimately we have to ask the question, is it useful? In other words, does it tell us something we don't already know? And from a scientific perspective, does it either predict things or does it help improve the prediction of things beyond existing measures? So here's healthy dependence, and this is just in college students, which is about 700 of our sample. You can see that all the forms of insecurity are negative related. So the more insecure you are, the less able you are to depend on others in a healthy manner. But that doesn't answer the question, does ambivalence add something? And indeed it does. This shows how much more variance we predict in an outcome. And you can see ambivalence helps us. So here's well-being. How happy have you been in the past seven days? Again, what you see is when you include ambivalence in the model, we get about 6% better at predicting it for college students. 
This looks at self-esteem. And again, we're looking at the current self-esteem. All three, again related, inclusion of ambivalence predicts another 5%. So the continuing theme is that when you use our scale in addition to existing scales, you're getting better and better and better at identifying people who have problems. And the final one that we looked at is stress-related physical symptoms. This was the one unique finding in that ambivalence was the only one to actually predict who in the past 30 days is experiencing high levels of stress-related physical symptoms. So here are some key take-homes from this research. One, insecure attachments do affect college students, and they can create challenges. They can make it hard to depend on other people, hard to cope. Including our measure improves predictions, helps us better understand the kind of students who are at risk. We need to do more work to validate the measure and continue with the theory, and that's what the lab is working on right now. If you're interested, you want to know more about any of this, you can go to my website here, and we have a write-up as well as the measure if you're interested in using it for research. Thank you very much.